ranking member, Mr. Johnson, who is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first question for Mr. Von Spakovsky. Thank you again for your expertise and for appearing before our committee uh, once more. Uh, isn't it true that the DOJ's July 28th guidance regarding state efforts to remove the temporary emergency COVID-19 voting procedures is now using those same temporary measures as the new baseline from which to judge compliance with the VRA? Well, that does appear to be what their guideline is doing, which is not a proper uh, interpretation of, of Section 2. And you will notice that in the prior testimony, it was made very clear, for example, that they had no interest in looking at all the changes that were made by um, state government officials violating state laws. That would normally be something that the Justice Department, particularly the voting section, would look at because when a, when a state official who has no authority uh, in the election area changes or does not abide by a law that the state legislature has passed, I mean, that would be something you should look at to see if there was a potentially discriminatory reason for doing that. And I don't quite understand why that is not something that's being examined. Well, I would venture to guess it looks like selective enforcement or at least selective analysis, but we'll let the, the, the facts speak for themselves. Do you think it's credible for anybody to argue that Congress intended for the DOJ to use temporary emergency voting measures adopted during a once in a lifetime pandemic to judge compliance with the VRA? No, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, in particular, because uh, look, the changes were made, the change, many changes that were made all over the country were done, uh, as you say, because of a once in a lifetime emergency measure uh, going back to the rules that were in place before that uh, can't be seen, I don't think, as somehow discriminatory. Uh, the, the laws that were in place at that time were not being uh, investigated, were not being sued uh, by the Justice Department. So clearly, at the time, they didn't think there was a problem with, with those rules. And now suddenly they think there are. That, that doesn't make sense from a uh, common sense point of view or, or from a proper interpretation of section two. Thank you. And just quickly restating the obvious, does the DOJ have the constitutional authority to reinterpret this statute? No, I don't think so. I think they've got to apply a Supreme Court precedent. That certainly is the way uh, it was, has always been done at the department. Uh, you, you do what the courts tell you, particularly the Supreme Court, when it comes to how you apply the statute. I, I just have to say also very quickly, uh, I think the Branovich decision correctly interpreted the law. They took the explicit language of section two, uh, the Senate factors, which everyone has agreed on um, uh, for years is the proper way to apply it. But in the past, because of the Thornburg versus Jingles decision, those Senate factors were only applied uh, because all the cases that came up were vote dilution cases, really redistricting cases. And what they did in this decision for the first time was say, well, here's, here's how you take these Senate factors and here's how you apply them to a vote denial case. And I don't see anything in the decision that is outside what they have previously done or outside the language of the statute. Thank you so much. Ms. Rorden, uh, thank you also for appearing uh, before us again. Apparently, we have to repeat and reiterate uh, what we've shared before. Let me, let me just ask you to summarize quickly. I'm running out of time. But is the VRA still working today without Sections 4B and 5? You may be muted. Check, check the mute button there. Sorry. OK, sorry about that. Um, I I do believe that the uh, permanent tools that are provided already with the permanent provisions of the Voting Rights Act are more than sufficient to target any type of uh, you know, bad state action or local jurisdiction action. Um, section two, um, it, you know, I know I hear a lot of complaints about section two that it's expensive um, and it takes people you know, like a long time um, to come forward with um, you know, the case because it is a civil matter. Bottom line is, um, Many of the times that people have said, oh, well, you didn't get our preliminary injunction, you know, ahead of the election for North Carolina, for example, when that case was moving forward, those particular laws that they were uh, challenging actually went forward. 
And what it showed was that um, the uh, increase in voter participation by um, non-white voters in North Carolina increased under the laws that they were attacking. So um, it may not be perfect you know, in, in every way, but it certainly provides um, the department as well as private plaintiffs uh, through the 14th and 15th amendment to bring these types of actions if they find that a state of jurisdiction is intentionally um, discriminating against voters. Thank you very much. I'm out of time. I would just say that I don't think there is any perfect legislation. I yield back.